On February 28, 2018, the residents of Spain celebrated Andalusia Day as usual, and the students enjoyed additional days off. One of those happy schoolchildren was 8-year-old Gabriel Cruz. So that he wouldn't get bored, Gabriel's father, Angel Cruz, decided to make him happy by taking him to his grandmother's house. Angel was divorced from Gabriel's mother, Patricia, but the former spouses maintained a very warm relationship for the sake of their child. Therefore, Gabriel's mother easily agreed to let him go to his grandmother's house, and Angel took the child to his mother, who lived in Las Hortichuelas. On the morning of February 27, 2018, the boy spent his time playing with his cousins, who lived next door to his grandmother. Around lunchtime, Gabriel returned to his grandmother's house to eat, after which he started asking again to be allowed to play with the girls because he wanted to have a bit more fun. At first, his grandmother refused, as he needed to take a short nap, but he kept persuading her, and eventually, the woman agreed. She looked out the window and watched as the boy ran towards the girls. In reality, their houses were just 100 meters apart, almost in a straight line. For Gabriel, it was a common thing to run back and forth since they were really close to each other. The grandmother saw how the child disappeared around the corner, which meant he had already reached the girl's place. It was a completely safe neighborhood, where everyone knew and got along with each other, so she wasn't worried at all. The boy left the house at around 3.30 to 3.45 p.m., but he never showed up at the relative's house. Since they didn't know that Gabriel was heading their way, it never occurred to them to be alarmed. The grandmother also assumed he was still playing with his cousins. Therefore, the family only realized that Gabriel was missing around 6 p.m. when the grandmother was waiting for him for dinner, and he hadn't returned. The grandmother called Patricia and Angel, and the boy's parents decided to contact the police. The investigation began. One of the hypotheses was that the boy simply got lost, but the parents couldn't believe it because Gabriel knew the area perfectly well, and the route from one house to another was a straight path he walked several times a day. Another version suggested that a criminal gang had kidnapped the boy to demand a ransom. However, Gabriel's parents were simple workers, and it was unlikely they could come up with a large sum of money on short notice. Through the media, Patricia and Angel appealed to the kidnappers or anyone who knew the child's whereabouts. They shared that Gabriel was a very kind, obedient, and loving child. They affectionately called him Fish because he adored the sea and dreamed of becoming a marine biologist at his young age. They cried and begged anyone who might know something about the child's location to help them, offering a reward of 10,000 euros, which friends, colleagues, and neighbors had gathered for the family. Volunteers distributed flyers describing the boy as wearing black pants, a white t-shirt, and a red hoodie. Meanwhile, search teams were formed. The searches, in which the police combed every corner within a radius of 6 and then 12 kilometers, continued for several days. Helicopters, search dogs and of course, volunteers assisted in the search for the boy. Among them was a girl named Ana Julia Quezada, who was Angel's girlfriend. It was she who made a crucial discovery in this case. Together with Angel, she was searching for Gabriel, and in the bushes 3.5 kilometers from the boy's grandmother's house, she found a white t-shirt. The t-shirt was lying near the Nijar water treatment plant, a Gia ravine and Las Negras water treatment plant. Anna recognized Gabriel's t-shirt because she had helped the boy get dressed that day. Laboratory tests confirmed that it had Gabriel's DNA on it. In other words, it was indeed his t-shirt. But where was the rest of his clothing and the boy himself? The public was relieved by the discovery, but for the police, it was strange because they had already searched that area and found nothing. Meanwhile, all the attention of journalists and the public was focused on a 42-year-old man named Diego Elfa because he suddenly became the main suspect in the police investigation. Diego had a strong attraction to Patricia, Gabriel's mother. At first, Patricia reciprocated his feelings, but it became overwhelming and obsessive. He became infatuated with Patricia, 
constantly calling her, showing up at her workplace, and worst of all, even going to Gabriel's school to intercept Patricia there. Additionally, Diego suffered from psychological disorders, and Patricia had to seek a restraining order against him through official channels. Even this did not deter him. Eventually, he was arrested, and upon release, he was equipped with an ankle bracelet to monitor his movements. Diego fit the profile of someone who might seek revenge, he knew the child, knew his mother, and could potentially blackmail Patricia. Moreover, he exhibited enough signs of mental instability to commit such an act. He later managed to remove the ankle bracelet, and continued to call Patricia. He was apprehended for violating the terms of his release, and the police searched his house and car. Everything seemed to point to Diego, as the prime suspect, at first glance. But, in reality, things were not quite as straightforward as they seemed. Indeed, investigators quickly dismissed the idea that Diego could be the kidnapper. Firstly, he lived 40 kilometers away from the place of the child's disappearance. Additionally, the police found three witnesses who saw Diego on the balcony of his house around 4.45 p.m. Considering that Gabriel had left his grandmother's house just before 4.30 p.m., Diego couldn't have possibly kidnapped the child, hidden him somewhere, and returned in such a short time. It was clear that he couldn't be in multiple places at once. Therefore, for a while, investigators pretended that Diego was their main suspect. However, secretly, they focused on Anna's behavior. One of the primary concerns for the investigators was that the t-shirt found by Anna was completely dry. This raised suspicions because it had been raining heavily for several days before the discovery. On the day she found the t-shirt in the bushes, there was no rain, but there should have been traces indicating that the t-shirt had been exposed to rain for several days. This placed Anna in the investigators' flight. Furthermore, she claimed that she and Angel found the t-shirt together. However, in reality, she found it while he was slightly behind her. It was also curious that Anna claimed to have sensed Gabriel's scent, leading her to find the t-shirt, even though the search teams couldn't find it. Moreover, Anna seemed to overplay her concern for the child, particularly when the cameras were on her. She appeared agitated, but at home, she showed no signs of distress. Her strange behavior was noticed not only by acquaintances but also by journalists and even Angel. Nevertheless, she continued shedding tears, demonstrating excessive anxiety. Strangely, she and Gabriel had a troubled relationship, and he openly expressed his dissatisfaction with her. Gabriel was never rude or spoiled, but he told Anna the truth. When asked for her phone, she claimed to have lost it, but when she allegedly found it, most of its contents were deleted. However, all these elements hardly qualified as evidence, so the police tried not to show their suspicions to avoid scaring Anna away. Subsequently, the investigators placed Anna under constant surveillance, tapped her phone, and installed a listening device in her car. Now, they needed to set a trap to catch her making a mistake and lead them to the child. The investigators contacted Angel and Anna and asked them to provide the key to a remote farm owned by Angel. They claimed they wanted to conduct a search there the next day as a precaution. Angel agreed to give the key and allowed them to search the farm. On the early morning of March 11, 2018, Anna began to act. She got into her car and headed to the farm. Interestingly, at that moment, she was not only being followed by the police but also by journalists, who found her behavior strange. When she arrived at the farm, she got out of the car with a blanket, and upon her return, something was clearly wrapped in the blanket. She placed the blanket in the trunk and headed to the house where she lived with Angel. When she was about to enter the garage of the house, the police stopped her. In the trunk of her car, they found the body of Gabriel. The arrest was captured on video by neighbors of the woman. Anna was shouting that she didn't understand anything and was not guilty, claiming that she had simply taken the car in the morning. However, at that moment, she was unaware that she had been under constant surveillance. Interestingly, Angel had known for several days that the police suspected his girlfriend, but he, along with Patricia, 
was asked to keep calm and not show any signs that Anna was the main suspect. It was incredibly brave of him to handle the situation, and it must have been incredibly difficult for him to sleep in the same bed as someone who could have killed his son. During the interrogation, the woman partially confessed to the murder of Gabriel but claimed it was an accident. She said she intercepted Gabriel when he was heading to his cousin's house. She told the boy that she was going to the farm to paint something and offered him to come along, promising they would quickly return. Gabriel got into the car with her, and they arrived at the farm. However, as her story unfolded, it became less credible. Anna recounted that Gabriel grabbed an axe and started yelling that he didn't like her, didn't want her dating his father, and wanted her to go back to the Dominican Republic. She claimed that at some point, she put her hand on him and managed to take the axe away. Supposedly, he continued yelling at her, and she wanted him to be quiet, so she covered his mouth and nose with her hands. She cried and swore that it was an accident. However, the autopsy revealed that besides being asphyxiated, Gabriel was also struck on the head and strangled for about 45 minutes, indicating a slow and agonizing death. Anna could have saved his life by calling for help, but she didn't. Afterward, Anna undressed Gabriel down to his underwear and buried his body in a shallow grave on the farm. She then covered the body with stones, got back into the car, and returned. On March 5th, she took his belongings and threw them into a glass recycling bin in a nearby neighborhood. After falling into the police trap, she hurried to the farm, exhumed the body, wrapped it in a blanket, and placed it in the car's trunk. The police had installed several listening devices in her car, which recorded her making derogatory remarks about the child on the way back. She lamented that they needed the boy and would get him. It's entirely unclear what she planned to do with him when they were caught, especially since she intended to take him to the garage of the house where she lived with Angel. At first, the police suspected she had an accomplice because they searched all the family cars, including Angel, Patricia, Anna, and other relatives, but found no traces of soil or blood. However, they later dismissed this theory and only charged Anna. The motives for the crime could have been twofold, money and jealousy. Firstly, Anna was jealous of Angel's relationship with his son and felt excluded from their close bond. Angel adored his child, and despite the separation, they had a wonderful relationship. They cared for the child and remained united through him. When Anna planned another trip to the Dominican Republic, Angel refused her request as he wanted to spend time with his son during that period. Obviously, all of these situations bothered Anna. Secondly, there was a motive related to money, partially supported by the fact that Anna was the one who spoke the most about increasing the reward for information about the boy. Additionally, her ex-lover's daughter mentioned that Anna was very calculating and greedy, and there were incidents when she could have killed him but refrained from calling for help when he was unwell, while they were living together. Anna came to Spain at the age of 21 and settled in Almeria. She worked as a prostitute in the Dominican Republic and met her ex-husband, who was a truck driver. He decided to rescue her from that profession and brought her to Spain. The family raised their daughter, but when they decided to move to Spain, they left Anna's older daughter, four-year-old Josefina, behind in her homeland. Unfortunately, in 1996, Anna's older daughter died under mysterious circumstances. Her husband woke up one morning and went to the children's room to check on the girls. He couldn't find Josefina but noticed a small table near the window. When he approached, he saw the girl lying on the asphalt below. She had fallen from the seventh floor. The police arrived, but they couldn't question the mother as she was in a state of shock. The case was considered an accident. Now, after the revelation that Anna killed Gabriel, there are discussions about the possibility that Anna might also be responsible for her daughter's death. However, investigating the case after almost 20 years is practically impossible, especially since an official decision had already been made, stating it was an accident. The trial for Gabriel's case took place in 2019. 
the defense requested three years of imprisonment for Anna for unintentional manslaughter, but that plea was rejected. Instead, she was sentenced to life imprisonment. She might be eligible for conditional release after 25 years. That means she could potentially be released in 2044, but only if she can demonstrate rehabilitation. Even if she is released, she won't be allowed to live in Nijar or approach the child's parents within 500 meters. She is also obligated to pay the child's parents 250,000 euros for moral damages and reimburse the state for the costs of the search for the child. In short, the guilty party received the maximum punishment and is currently serving her sentence in prison. One might think that Gabriel's family could now move on and remember what a wonderful boy he was, forgetting about the media. However, that's not the case. Numerous posts have appeared on the internet, inviting people to visit certain websites, to see the body of the deceased Gabriel. If one followed these links, they would see a child's face, but it was a horrifically mutilated body of a different child. There were also other methods to gain likes or make money by exploiting images of children. This happens because the law doesn't protect the privacy of deceased individuals as it does for the living. Now, Gabriel's parents are fighting to ensure that relatives of deceased children, whose images are being used in such a manner, have the right to demand the removal of such images or even entire websites.